Cause I did it my way Not y'all can say In this life for the next one Watch me I will be the best I am what I am today Cause I did it my way Not Welcome to The Deal. I'm Danny Brown. Just want to let you guys know, we just won the award for Best Business Podcast in Los Angeles 2019, the best of LA. So we appreciate that and appreciate them. That's awesome. Today's guest, special guest, Matt Hannaford, baseball agent extraordinaire, one of the biggest baseball agents in the world, negotiated Manny Machado's record-breaking contract. It was the largest free agency contract negotiated in American history. It's a $300 million deal. Great guy. We get into youth sports, issues and challenges with amateurs, whether they want to sign, go pro, go college, um, all sorts of interesting good stuff. The Nationals, what they're doing right now, and Doc getting the blame for the Dodgers and Kershaw. But, you know, really, if Kershaw was put into 100 more positions like that, they would never hit two home runs in a row. Um, anyway, enjoy, listen, learn. See ya. You're listening to The Deal. I'm Danny Brown. Special guest today, my boy Matt Hanford from MVP Sports, one of the biggest sports agents in the world, actually represented Manny Machado and uh, signed the biggest free agency contract in sports history. That's pretty impressive. I enjoyed that day. It was a, it was a good day. <laughs> good for you. Good yeah, for thank Manny. You. Thank you. Uh, my boy Lozo couldn't meet couldn't meet us today. He's in Washington D.C. I is. hear he is punk ass. So yeah. he'll come next time. But next time, a shout out to Lozo. Um, you guys have built this massive baseball agency. Incredible. Focus on baseball. Why don't you tell me before we get into it? I know we're in the middle of the World Series. Nationals up 2-0. And we were talking about the Dodgers collapse. But before we get into all that stuff, why don't we start with you sure. and how you got into it and were you a, where you grew up? Were you a baseball player and how you got into being a sports agent? I, I was. So I actually was born. Not many people know this. I was born in Thousand Oaks. So you're a local. Yeah. Um, at at I guess nine years old, I moved to Sacramento. Um, dad got transferred for work. So go to Sacramento, and you can imagine a kid who grows up in Thousand Oaks going to Zuma Beach as a kid. Yeah. Right? Mom take, takes Ooh. me there throughout the summer. And Boogie boarding. That's having right. A good time. Surfing, Surfing, believe it or not. Beach. Yeah. Uh, and moves to Sacramento, and I remember driving up there thinking, where are we going? Right? <laughs> like, I've been on this freeway for, it must have been six hours, and... <laughs> We get off the freeway. I, I, I vividly remember this. We get off the freeway and we just pass Lodi and we're driving. And so we're driving and we're driving and we must have been 20 minutes in. And I'm like, like, where is this place? Right? Literally like cow pastures on both yeah, sides. Right. That's and I remember exactly. coming up to a stop sign and then just getting around the bend after the stop sign. And there's a barn on the right hand side of the road. And then behind the barn, and I couldn't see it yet, but behind the barn was a like a mobile or a portable classroom. And my dad literally stops the car and he says, you see that? That's your school. And like right then, I remember at nine years old, I started crying. Yeah. Right? Like, my Beach. life is over. <laughs> this is the worst. Yeah. And so. Um, oh, that's traumatizing. Yeah. So I end up, you know, spending obviously my, my what I call my formative years in Sacramento, which looking back, reflecting back on it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, but I ended up going to Elk Grove High School. Prior to high school, though, I played uh, baseball. I played hockey, ice hockey. Okay. I played a year of football, a year of soccer, and then a couple years of basketball. Well, all so, sports. You were involved with all the sports. Yeah, and we could talk about that later. But how, you know, during my childhood, that was what was normal, yeah. right? Kids, there was no year-round No anything. specialization. Right. Um, yeah. It was actually, I guess, probably more frowned upon if you were going to play one sport versus others. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I ended up uh, Were going- Were you in Sacramento, the city, or one of the suburbs? One of the suburbs. So yeah. the high school I went to was Oak Grove High School, right? And is that the area, Oak Grove? So Elk Grove was where I got off the freeway, okay? <laughs> so where I grew up is a place called Rancho Murrieta, which was 30 miles in the middle of nowhere. Boondocks? Yeah, 30 yeah. miles. So every day, which in a weird way, I, I think back on that time, and it it taught me so much about life, like preparation, because you got to imagine as a kid, you know, at 13 years old, my mom's taking me to school or I'm getting on the bus or my sister's taking me to school. And like, you have to actually plan out your whole day, right? I'm not coming home till seven, eight o'clock at night. Got so it. what do I wow. need from now until then? Yeah. 
Um, but I ended up going to Elk Grove High School and at that time had shut down every other sport except baseball. And Elk Grove has produced the most major league baseball right. players, Big if you can believe that. School, yeah. yeah. And so I uh, went to Elk Grove for four years. And at the end of high school, I had an opportunity. It was either, okay, I can go get my education and shut down sports or try to maybe walk on or I can go to Sacramento City College. Yeah, well, that's so a big I, baseball school it too. Is, yeah. It is, it is. It produces a lot of baseball players as well. So I ended up going to Sacramento City College uh, more than anything, just because I wasn't willing to give up the game yet, yeah. right? So I go to Sacramento and a bunch of my buddies were there. And it was one of those places that uh, at the time, junior college baseball had no limitations, yeah. right? And so uh, there not only was no limitations, but they could have what you probably know of draft and follows, mm -hmm. which is a player gets drafted and then a, an organization that drafts them doesn't have to sign them right then. They can essentially watch him, you know, quote unquote. And then in the event that they want to sign him right before the next draft, they can then they sign can. him then. So yeah. you'd have really, really good baseball players that decide, you know what? I don't want to go to school for three years right before my draft again. I just want to go for one and see if I can turn this into something. Yeah. So we had legitimate baseball guys there every sure. single year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there were 65 players that would show up and we'd have tryouts and the whole no, deal. I so I played a year at uh, at uh, LA City College because okay. I was at, I got recruited by Irvine and they dropped their baseball program because of Title IX. So I, and Kevin Millar was uh -huh. at LA City College and he's like, you got to come here, bro. So I know all about Sac City yeah. and the Ju JUCO. And yeah, there was a lot of guys that were going to be high draft picks that didn't want to go to D1 schools. They right. wanted to be one and done. And that's what schools like Sac City were. Yeah, and Juco, Juco baseball in general. It's, hard, it's com highly competitive. And yeah. it has, it's completely changed now. Yeah. Um, but at the time, so I stay there for uh, two years. I ended up redshirting. I got hurt. I redshirted my first year uh, and then played my second year. And I just remember this feeling of like, you know, Sacramento City, because they were so competitive, they almost treated it like – in a weird way, like the military, like it was <laughs> every single day, you know, waits at 430 in the morning from what I remember. And so me living so far away, I'm getting up at three. It yes. was this whole thing. Wow. So by the time everything was said and done, I just remember having this feeling in the pit of my stomach, like I got to get out of here. And I always wanted to go back to Southern California. My sister was at Long Beach State at the time. So I ended yeah. up going to Long Beach. Um, and my whole plan was I'm going to go walk on, walk on at Long Beach. And I'm going to just see what, you know, more than anything, it's like, look, I want to meet a bunch of good people. I want to be around the game. I don't know why yet. I don't know that I'm going to necessarily have a future in it, but that yeah. was my plan. So I go to Long Beach. Was Justin Turner there? Then? Uh, No, Turner was at Fullerton. Oh, he was at Fullerton. I thought yeah. he was at Long Beach. Uh, this was like before Jared Weaver. Um, It was before Evan Longoria, before yeah, all those guys. a lot of good players oh, yeah. that came out of Long Beach. Yeah, like this was after obviously Jason Giambi. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I ended up going to the first practice and just literally showing up and I had nothing. And so I remember thinking, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up calling my junior college coach and I said, uh, well, actually, let me back up. So while I was at Sacramento City College, I had a handful of buddies who had the chance to get drafted. Mm -hmm. And there was one in particular, uh, my buddy Dustin, who um, was getting, you know, recruited. I, I shouldn't even say recruited. It was more like the scouts were basically following him. And he was really kind of perplexed with this whole idea of like, should I plan on go going to college? Should I sign? What should yeah, I do? Yeah, yeah. And he big... had no idea how to analyze that, that, that decision. And so he kind of used me as a sounding board more than mm -hmm. anything. I think, you know, it wasn't that like, here I was this guy that was acting like an agent back right. then. It was just, I was his buddy and he felt like, I don't know who else to talk to. Right. Let's talk through this together. That's interesting. And Organically, it was just, you were giving him advice and yeah, being a friend. Yeah, totally innocent. And, yeah. But what's interesting is I remember thinking to myself, I have no idea how to analyze this decision, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that feeling that I was left with was like, I want to be able to know what to tell this guy. So yeah. I ended up literally reading a ton of books. I read there you go. a whole different ball game by Marvin Miller, who's uh -huh. the old uh, executive director of the MLBPA. I read Kurt Flood's book. I started just dissecting all these books and then through that process learned about what an agent does. Yep. Uh, and I got really intrigued. So fast forward now to when I hung up my spikes at Long Beach, I call my junior college coach and I say, look, I think I know what I want to do. Do you know anybody? Mm -hmm. And he gives me Danny's number. Lozo. Yeah. And I'm thinking <laughs> naively at the time, right? I'm 20 years old. I'm thinking, 
all right, I'm going to call this guy and I'm going to be able to come in. And he's yeah, going to yeah. bring me on. It's so going to be great. calling Danny Lozano. Oh, it's going to be great. Yeah. He's hanging with Mike Piazza. Well, no, that and, was the uh, thing is, so I asked my coach, I said, so who is this guy? I hadn't yeah, heard you of had him. no idea. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you know, they just represent Barry Bonds, Jose Canseco, you know, Mike Piazza, uh, Kurt Schilling, Trevor Hoffman. And I'm just like, just a few this guys. is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I reach out to him and I leave him a message. Crickets. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll give it a couple of days. Uh, yeah. Call him. Leave him a message. Crickets. Nuts. <laughs> and so I gave it. It was about... Uh, I would say about a month where I was calling like once a week. Yeah. And I played with a handful of guys that they represented. Got it. Right. <clears throat> and so I'm in the voicemail, like, you know, so creatively upset. dropping. Yeah. I played with Doug Redvig and I played with Joe Thurston and you know, like you can trust me. Yeah. I, he, Danny was from Sacramento. I'm from Sacramento. I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah. How am I not getting a phone call back? And so, uh, sure enough, I ended up calling him after that first month. I'm like, now I'm pissed. So I call him every day. I call them every day for another five months. Just leaving voicemails so, or messages? Yeah, just voicemails. And it was like, it was the same. I got to a point where it was like, okay, now I'm going to leave you the same exact Matthew. message. So I left him the same message. Sure enough, six months <laughs> later, uh, right. he finally calls me. Literally, and of course, I don't answer my phone, yeah. right? Oh. Yeah, because I'm like, what's this number? He calls me from his cell. I yeah. didn't even have a cell. So I was calling him in the office. So I'm like, I don't know that person. And so I don't answer and it's him. So I get the voicemail and I'm like frantically like trying to call him back. Like now he's not going to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he literally brings me in and he, t he tells me, he says, uh, come in on, this was a, a, on a Friday. He goes, come in on Monday um, and, you know, we'll talk. We're not hiring, but just come in and like, we'll talk. We'll see if there's anything that, you know, maybe you can help us out around here doing something. And so I remember thinking to myself, okay, so calling him every day helped. It was a Friday. I'm like, what can I do to send a message to him that I'm serious? So I'm like, what time do they get in the office? They probably get in at like eight. So I'm going to get there like six. So I get there super early to where no one else is there. I'm literally waiting outside the office. And the first person that comes in, um, I've come to learn, obviously, after the fact, it was one of the partners from there. And he's like, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I have a meeting with Dan Lozano. And he's like, well, what time's your meeting? And I said, uh, nine. It's like, it's literally 7.30. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, who is oh, wait. This? this is Jeff, Jeff Boris. Boris. <laughs> My boy Jeff. Yeah. I said, no, no, no I'll, I'll wait. i get him in here too. Yeah. I said, I'll wait. So um, I'm literally waiting in the waiting room. And he's thinking you are nuts. Like, who? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think Jeff was probably like, this kid's, uh, who knows what he's thinking, right? Um, and so Danny interviews me and he says, all right, I'll, I'll bring you on for an internship. Um, but again, like, we're not hiring. So yeah. whatever you want to make of this, it's up, it's to, up you. to you. And yeah. my plan at that point was like, all right, look, it was amazing getting into the office because I'm seeing all the jerseys on the wall like, and wow. I'm like, this is the place to be. Um, and I and I told myself, I said, look, I'm going to give this everything I have. If they don't hire me, I'm going to go to law school. If they do hire me, it's too good of an opportunity. I'm going to run with it. Yeah. And so that was in like, I think it was. You were like, in college still? I was in college. I was a yeah. junior now. And I want to say it was like in June. And so... Um, I ended up making my class schedule once school started to be all night classes. Got it. So I would work full all days, day. Monday through Friday, take night classes, and then I worked <laughs> at Joe's Crab Shack <laughs> on the weekend. There you got some free crabs. Yeah. No, 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 the one in Long Beach. Oh, yeah. LBC. Which a funny story, like the office at one point at Beverly Hills made me dance for the entire office. Because you know that's one of the things with Joe's Crab Shack, like you have to dance. Okay. They made me dance. <laughs> Uh, yeah, one day, but that's, that's another, another, another story for another day. So at this time that you're, this is how many years ago? Wait, so was I was 20 years old. Um, God, you so were... I was in, yeah, it was like 2001. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is, is this, was Dennis still involved or is that? Dennis wasn't, Dennis had, I don't know how long or how, uh, recent before I started that he left. So that was already, it was relatively soon though. Like maybe a couple years yeah right but he would like stop by the office so involved. he certainly was he's in this building i see him oh is I, he Kev. so funny story you know just, i see him i see him at the dodger games right yeah of course him. i see yeah. him every dodger game him and kurt ravivore so funny story footnote reason why i know lozo is not just because i know lozo but i entered in college when i was done playing baseball and that was when it was dennis gilbert rick thurman jeff and i, I love those guys i ended up going into music and doing other things, but I had the best time and I, too funny. you know, had the great relationship with all of them. I loved it. And that's uh, funny. Yeah. So small world hearing you say it, it's like, Oh well, yeah. They're like, I kind of did. Yeah. I, I did, that, did too. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was, I was 20 years old and, uh, 
at the time, you know, I'm like, I'm going to make the most of this. Yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to make this guy hire me. I'm going to make myself so valuable that he has no choice. Right. Right. And that's basically what I did. And so I end up, I was there for six months as an intern. And at the time, two of the younger agents left. And so they had a need. All of a sudden there was like, there was this void. We need younger guys in here. And so yeah. they ended up hiring me full time while I was in college. Um, Incredible. So Good now at least you. I'm getting paid, which was nice. Even like, though it wow. wasn't much, yeah. I was getting paid. And um, funny story. So I, I, the very, I guess I'm still in my first year there. And uh, they asked me, said, hey, can you go to spring training? And of course. Like, yeah. don't you have class? Don't worry about class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can make this work. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I ended up going to spring training for, it was, it was th- close to three weeks. And I was Amazing. a business, I was a business finance major. So I come back to, I come back to school and my very first day back, I have a finance class I, I walk into and we have an exam. It's been three weeks. And it's you been have three weeks, and I have like not checked in. You don't know what's going. No, on. and like I was a good, I was a good student to where like I'll figure this out. <laughs> so I, I sit down and I'm just thinking to myself, this is not You're good. Screwed. It's finance, like you can't really just wing it, right? I don't know what the subject matter was that we yeah, were talking you have about. No idea. And so I'm like, all right, well, I'll figure this out. So uh, I sit down, and it must have been five minutes into the test, and my phone, you know, those small desks we sit on, yeah. right? Those really small ones. So it's like. My phone was off to the side on top of my desk. Now, why was my phone on my desk? Because I was an agent and these guys may need something. <laughs> yeah. So like, I got to be prepared. So yeah. sure enough, five minutes in, I look at my phone, it's vibrating. Mike Piazza. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, oh no. And I remember it was, it was close to one o'clock. That's fantastic. Right? And, and as you know, like one o'clock, one thirty is when these guys go to the field. Get ready for the game. And all of a sudden now you can't reach them. And yeah. I don't remember what specifically it was that I had to talk to them about. But he's calling my phone. And so I grab my phone and I remember looking at my teacher off in the corner of my eye. And my teacher is staring at me. Like, because, yeah, he can hear my phone. And so I, I can only imagine like what's going on in his head. He's thinking, like, is this kid serious? Yeah. He's like actually thinking about whether he's going to take this call. Phone call. And so I just remember You're it was like, like Mike Piazza, bro. my gut was just like, just take it. So I grab my phone and I walk outside. And sure enough, I'm out there and I answer. I'm like, hey, Mikey, what's going on? And right then I feel a tap on my shoulder. And so I turn around and my teacher is like fuming. And I just like literally split decision. I just showed him my phone and he sees it and he goes, oh. And he literally backs away and he goes inside. (laughs) And so I finished the phone call. must have been like six minutes, right? Finish the phone call and I walk inside. And I remember like very hesitantly like, looking off to the corner of my eye and he wasn't even paying attention, right? So I'm like, wow. So I ended up getting through the test, which we don't need to talk about. Yeah. And uh, I'm leaving class and my teacher obviously kind of like motions me to come over. And he says, so what do you do? And I told him who I work for. And he says, so is that why you were gone? And I said, that's actually why I was gone. I was in spring training. He goes, okay, well, you know, whatever you need, like you got it. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. So amazing. Yeah. So, so he just became a fan right oh, there. And, and like, it was nice because obviously now it, there were days where, Hey, can I go to class? Can I get some help here. That's or there? right. And, and, and as you know, in that business or in this business that I'm still in, it's no different than yours. Now it's a 24 seven thing. Of course. So you're answering your phone at all hours of the day. If there's something important, I'm in class. Hey, can I step out and take this? Yeah. Go ahead. You know. Sure. And think about it, if you're a business professor, you got a kid in your class that's actually in a big time industry yeah, right now. Some, right. This is legit. Like he's probably right. so excited. But what a funny story. So now fast forward, you become an agent. Uh, you've now just signed this three hundred million dollar contract for Manny. So you've come a long way. Uh, yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your, you know, your client list today and how, how does the company look today? Yeah. So um, the thing that I will tell you about kind of how we're structured and how we're set up is you know, and I'll even go back to our days at Beverly Hills. Um, you know, Beverly Hills was one out of one Beverly of Hills I would, sports. Yeah, Beverly Hills sports. Council, you, so yeah, I would, I would say we were one of kind of like the big 400 pound gorillas, for lack for of a better sure. term, yeah. had, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients. First big contracts. And yes, oh, yeah. One, one after the next. And they were they were around well before I was. Yeah. yeah of right. Course. And so learning the business um, at 20 years old, being around those players you can imagine what my role was at that time, right? I'm learning the business. I'm doing whatever I can to just absorb as much as possible. And so I'm trying to add value to every player's life. So what I kind of created for myself was I essentially served as what I would call kind of the number two to almost every player that we had. Yeah. And so when we started MVP, 
um, we, we didn't necessarily want to duplicate the same thing. We wanted to have a completely different approach to the business. And so what we envisioned was how can we represent uh, the best players in the game, right? How can we create a team of people who all work for these individual players? And so like imagine a um, kind of like a flow chart, right? Mm -hmm. Where a lot of agencies, I think in every sport, the way that they're structured is you're going to have an agent and underneath the agent, you're going to have several people. And then underneath the people, you're going to have a bunch of players, right? And so depending on the level the player's at in his career, he's going to deal with one particular person as he moves up. He's going to move up along with them and then eventually sure. kind of deal with the head guy down the road if and when he gets to the time to sign yeah. for a big contract. Yeah. We wanted to structure completely different. We wanted to figure out, okay, how can we provide – the same level of service and representation for a guy like an Albert Pujols or a Manny Machado um, and, and, and essentially duplicate that for a younger player who, let's say, out of the draft in the minor leagues coming up, right? Yeah. And so my focus has always been, and I'll speak for myself, is how can I add just an immense amount of value to a player's life, right? Mm -hmm. And if that is our focus at all times, you know, we're going to always have really, really good players um, and be fortunate to do these really, really good deals. Yeah. So, and when you say adding value to their life, you mean business advisor, friend, therapist, therapist family, everything. everything across the board, Absolutely. all sorts of personal stuff, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think when you're in the business, like there's a term that I like to use autodidact, which is basically like you're a self educator, right? And so I take, whether it's classes, go to seminars, I'm constantly feeding my brain with information because if I can add uh, one little thing in a conversation with a player who may who maybe is like 0 for 30, right? Yeah. He could be in low A for all I know, yeah. Yeah. but he's 0 for 30 and he's clearly struggling. If I could say one thing that he can then take away and and you know it helps him in any fashion, like that's, that's my job essentially, right? Totally. And so I've looked at this and I've said, look, okay, I know how to negotiate a really good contract, right? I know how to guide a player from the time he's 15 years old, let's say, until the time he's 40, mm -hmm. right? But what are those things in between? All those little, um, you know, intricate details, how can I improve on those things as well? And not just thinking about the two extremes and ignoring the rest, really focusing on kind of the meat and potatoes there in the middle. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I've, uh, you know, I've separated myself, I think, in, um, the business, and I don't know if this is something you want to talk about, but I feel like the business of baseball, I'll just speak about that because I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, so familiar. I sure. think it's changing quite a bit, right? Especially the representation business. You have, um, you know, everybody watched the movie Jerry Maguire mm -hmm. and had this romantic vision of, uh, you know, being <laughs> around professional athletes and, you know, walking the red carpet and, yeah. ooh, you know, being the person that's going to lead him down this path. And so the market was basically flooded with a bunch of these individuals that said, hey, that's what I want to do. And yeah. so I think what started to happen is, you know, people would get a little bit of experience. Maybe they had a buddy who uh, was a superstar in high school and mm -hmm. maybe goes to college. And that guy says, you know what? I don't want to be with a big agency. I want to be with my buddy, mm -hmm. you know, and if that if that uh, player is fortunate enough to have success, gets to the point where now he's going to sign a big contract and decides to stay with that buddy maybe that buddy has an opportunity to do the contract. Yeah. And if he does, now does he build a practice off right. of doing that one does he contract? leverage it? That's off. right. And so that's happened so many times that we're being surrounded by all these agents that um, are following this checklist, right? And they say, okay, if I can check all these boxes, I can represent a player. If I yeah. talk to them about equipment, I can represent a player. If I talk to them about card signings, I can represent a player. If I can talk to the team on his behalf, yeah. And so they start analyzing that way. And the unfortunate part is um, what's starting to happen in our business is, okay, so how do you separate yourself then? Yeah. Okay, I got to offer more services, right? Okay, well, you're going to offer more services for the same price. So you're doing more and more and more work for the same amount of money. And so you slowly start to see all these agents' heads explode. Yeah. And so my focus, instead of having that be the thing I'm, I'm paying attention to, is how can I not worry about that and really focus on just continuing to add massive value. Yeah. And so that's my big thing is like add massive value. That's your anchor. Keep coming back that's to it. that. Don't chase down the more services or cutting fees or this or that. That's a game you can't win. No. And it's I could totally relate as an agent in our business. It's very similar. There's people that had one big client that bought one big house 
and I can't tell you now how now they're in the business or their family, they're gonna get their license, sell their family's big house, and now we're in the business and we're trying to leverage it. There's so much of that. Yeah, we probably deal with a lot of the same stuff. You know, I get players call me all the time and they say uh, they're at the end of their career. Hey, I want to be an agent. It looks like the best job in the world. Yeah. And it's yeah. great. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not yeah. trying to downplay it by any means, but right. it's, it's not that simple. No. Right. Like no. any job, there are great things about it. And there are things that are really, really it's difficult. It's really hard. And yeah. it seems like real estate's the same way. It is the same way, although I'm not dealing with 16 year olds from the Dominican Republic that making making decisions in my 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 livelihood and my family's livelihood depends on it where you are every day. That's right. the game you're in. Um, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear. There's so many ways to go, but I'd love to hear. So people have an idea because you said even though you're at the top of the game and you're representing some of the biggest players, uh, you also said that there's some guys that, you know, you'll take on at a high school or college. And I want people to understand when someone signs at a high school or college, yes, they get a bonus if they're a top guy. But talk, talk to me about what is the minimum, the first year, second year, minor leaguer salary, oh, right. what their life is really like, sure. uh, where they're living in the motels, what they're, uh -huh. the, the reality. Because when you go, when you're in baseball, you don't go to the show. You know, no. It doesn't matter who you are. No. So, so tell us a little um, bit how, what it's what it's like and how hard it is to make it, even if you're a top draft pick. So I'll actually go even further back. Uh, what's unique about today's day and age is youth baseball is looks completely different than when I was experiencing totally. it and you were experiencing it. Right. Uh, yeah. You have all these travel teams Club where, teams, yeah, yeah, to some degree. And you have a kid. Yeah, we're, right? we're just starting it. Yeah, and I'm seeing it. So you have what's essentially happened is youth baseball has turned into the pros, yeah, right? Yeah. And I think social media is a part of it. A lot of these travel organizers, right? The perfect games and the PBRs and all these companies, they're all a part of it as well, yeah. where, you know, there's now a platform for these players to really kind of experience this professional environment. Yeah. And so these, these kids man. are just, they're enamored by it, right? Which I understand. But what's unfortunate is these parents are being put in a position Imagine, you know, you have a, the luxury of playing baseball, right? You played yeah. baseball, you know, people that obviously are in a position like me where you can call me and say, hey, is this smart? Should we do this? Should we not do it? Imagine being a family who, let's just say, is in Illinois or Iowa or, you know, Missouri, who doesn't know anybody. And they're relying on a travel ball coach mm -hmm. who benefits from telling them they need to go to an event or they're relying on what they read right. on the Internet. And, you know, I've been going on these Facebook groups and really kind of putting myself out there and letting all these families know if you have questions, reach out to me because I, I'm reading the comments and it's like parents attacking other parents yeah. for not doing what they did and telling them they're stupid. Yeah. Coaches attacking parents, it's telling awful. them that they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And there's this huge divide that's that's occurring. So, um, you know, one of the things I'm doing is I'm putting myself out there, letting all these families know, look, if you have any questions, message me, reach out to me. I'd be happy to kind of give you advice. That's um, important. Absolutely. Because I'm seeing it. And there is a huge divide, a huge void between what the parents think they should be doing and in some case what the coaches think they know and should be doing well, versus what's good for the children and what's going to be good for them down the road if they are a serious competitor. And by the way, you know, my oldest is eight and a half. At eight and a half, 10, 12, 14, it doesn't matter if you're hitting 20 home runs a little. Like, that doesn't even mean you're going to play in high school. And these people don't know that. Or they really if, don't know Or that. if you are in high school, and let's say you're from a small town, and you threw five no-hitters in a row in five consecutive games, that doesn't mean you're going to be a first-round pick or even get drafted. Correct. Like that's The Correct. result isn't necessarily the thing that they're hanging their hat on. Right. Um, but to go back to that, like my, my whole thing with these families is I believe parents deserve to make really critical decisions like this with information. And so it's like, how can I be kind of that conduit to give them that information to make educated decisions? Yeah. Um, but to talk a little bit about, you know, what does it look like in, in, you know, amateur baseball, even going into like professional baseball? I mean, look, at the end of the day, what these scouts are looking for is someone who ultimately is going to be the next, we'll call it Mike Trout, yeah. right? But that happens at different stages for every player. Right there, Albert Pujols is a perfect example. It was a 13th round pick. Yeah. So how many teams had to pass up on him over and over and over, and they were all wrong. Yeah. Right. There was one scout that was kind of right, kind of, because it's not like he signed for a ton of money. Yeah. He didn't. He was a 13th round draft pick. Right. right. So, um, but no, when you get into pro ball, you know, you're making 
uh, we'll call it to make it you know simple, close to a thousand dollars a month. Right. For five months. For half the year. Yeah, right. And months. so if you're somebody who doesn't sign for a lot of money out of the draft, you're getting a job in the off season. Yeah. Right. You're, you're essentially putting your life on hold to see if you can live this dream. Yeah. Right. Um, so and then above and beyond that, you know, remove the paycheck. Let's assume the pay was great. I mean, yeah, your your games are getting over. You're basically showing up to the field that we'll call it one o'clock every single day. Yeah. Right. You're at the field from one. Your game starts at seven. You're going to be there until 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. By the time you leave and get back to your hotel room or your apartment, it's midnight. Yeah. You know, you're lucky to find a Wendy's open to right. grab dinner. You yeah. know, you're going to get some spread in the clubhouse. But what is it? Is it a bologna sandwich? Yeah. You, you, right. So it's not it's it's not glamorous by any means. Yeah. Um, and this is years. This oh, yeah. Is not like one season. No, the average player is so out of high school. The average player spends five and a half years in the minor leagues. Yeah. The average player out of college spends four and a half years in the minor leagues. Yeah. Right. And then the way that the pay works is you're making next to nothing in the minor leagues like that. Right. You're getting an incremental bump every single year. But we're talking 50 to 100 dollars. Yeah. You can't and, survive. Off no. That. And then at some point and I'm going to not touch on one component of that because it's really complicated, but. When you get to the big leagues, now you're making the first year, you're going to make the minimum, yeah. right? What's minimum now? Minimum is 555. So 555 a year. Yeah, which is, hey, that's good money. But yeah. imagine being with the New York Yankees. Mm -hmm. So you're having to get an apartment in New York, right? You have to dress well. You have to have suits for the yeah, road you're and all broke. that. You're hanging out with guys that are making millions. millions so you're going yeah. out to dinners yeah. that you probably shouldn't be going out to. Yeah. Um, and so you're lucky to have a hundred grand by the end of the yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, not sure. to mention, you know, people don't like to pay attention to taxes, but taxes is a big thing too. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, by the time you get to arbitration, which is after your third full season, you may be six, seven, eight years into it, yeah. right? You may be 26, 27, 28 years old. Easy, yeah. You know, and in 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 to the Machado negotiations now, real fast. You know, one of the things I heard through those negotiations, and I won't tell you what team, but they said, look. You know, we were talking about the different landscape when we were doing Albert Pujols' deal, right? Albert Pujols at the time was a 32-year-old free agent, mm -hmm. right? Manny Machado was a 26-year-old free agent. Right. And so you can see how much more valuable a guy like Manny would be right. potentially to a club because the way these teams view it is age does matter, mm -hmm. right? And one of the teams, the owner said, 32 is the new 40, Right. And so to think about that, it's like, wow, the thought process of how long these guys can stick around the game has completely, completely changed. changed. And I think part of that comes from there just being a massive amount of data available now where they're just paying attention to it. They're saying, well, partly because, hey, there's no performance enhancers anymore, right? Or at least they're trying to get rid of all of them. So the guy who maybe was 38 years old who was putting up good numbers, you could arguably say, was that because he was on performance yeah. enhancers? Was he juice so today you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, so at 35, you start to see this kind of down downhill yeah. you know, decline. Um, and so I think they've just gotten really, really smart and they've analyzed it and said, yeah, you know, we don't want to have to offer that massive contract to somebody who's 32 anymore but obviously, we got a 10-year deal for Manny. They were comfortable doing it with someone at 26. Yeah. And was a big draw to him being in San Diego and a, being a big Latino uh, culture there, a big baseball yeah, following? I, I, or I was it just, hey, this was the best all-around deal? No, I think you know him and his wife are really, really smart people. They analyzed everything, right? The city, the weather, the players that he played with that he knew growing up. Um, that part of it was certainly yeah. important. Um, he grew up where? He grew up in Miami. Okay. Yeah, I but I mean, like, coming through the minor leagues, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, Guys, he knew yeah. Hosmer. Hosmer's yeah. obviously from Florida. So, like, he put all of these pieces together. And, you know, he, one of the things that I, you know, I'll take a little bit of credit for this is we, our biggest job in that is to negotiate, or I'm sorry, our biggest job throughout that process is to educate the players, yeah. right? <clears throat> and so when you're talking to these players about um, this big of a decision, right? They're looking at you for guidance. Like, hey, look, man, here's my thought. What are your thoughts? And so you're kind of formulating their thought process as you go on, making sure that they understand, look, you know, let's throw all this stuff down. Let's let us help you kind of walk through this situation and how you should be thinking of it. And then really kind of dive into it even deeper the more, you know, you go into that negotiation. So yeah. Um, yeah. they certainly literally looked at, you know, a ton of stuff. They looked at potential charities they could partner with. I mean, so it, it was deep. It's just oh, such absolutely. a deep analysis. And absolutely. And they did that with every single team. It wasn't yeah. just the Padres. It was every team they looked at. And how many teams were they seriously looking when it came down to it? How many teams are in that? 
Like, how, who's he looking at? Like, what is it? One other? Is it five others? When it gets down to that level of a contract with that kind of a player, how many teams are in the running that you're really talking to? It, there were, at that time, there was four teams. So it, so it gets, um, becomes a five. It becomes, a, yeah, it becomes a, much smaller the more you go in. <clears throat> um, you know, but the unique thing about the negotiation this past year was, you know, we ended up signing in February, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you go back to the time Albert uh, did that deal, we did that deal in December, right? And so what was unique was, um, you know, if you would have asked me, were the Padres going to be a team in December, I probably would have said, I don't think so, really? right? I don't think they're going to be, and they change. could, but I don't think so. Um, but the longer the offseason went on, you know, the more these teams have the ability to kind of piece and, and, you know, I think what they ended up doing ultimately was, hey, let me put Manny in our lineup and let me see what that looks like and what team wouldn't fall in love with that yeah, idea. of course. Right? Of course. Uh, so. Yeah. Let me switch it up a little bit and we can, uh, I want to talk about your take on signing out of high school versus going to uh, college and getting the full college life experience, knowing that, especially sitting from where you're sitting, but knowing that there's plenty of top draft picks that never make it to the show, that never get there. So, you know, balancing business where, hey, you want to make money, your job is <clears throat> to get the best players and give them the best contracts. But in terms of like on a personal level, with your experience, what you've seen, and if you were going to say, hey, here's my advice to to my son mm-hmm. or my brother on, hey, high school or college, and why pros and cons and why? Because I know it's not black and white, and it's different for each player, and depending where they where they're from and where they're going. So that's the first part of the question. The next part of the question is, what do you think about what's happening with now college players are going to get paid, and what's your take on that? So first, start with the dilemma: of, Do you sign out of high school, or do you go get the college life experience? So I think it totally depends on the individual, right? And I don't think. I would not be doing my job if I gave you any other answer. And so, you know, for me to answer that question with every individual, I have to ask a ton of different questions, yeah. right? I have to analyze, you know, where are you at with school? Is, is are, Do you look at yourself like a student? Do you want to get your education? Does that even sound appealing, right? Mm-hmm. But you're having to kind of balance that side of it. And then also, what's the smart thing to do for you baseball-wise, right? If, and I'll let, let's play this out. So let's just say, uh, you have somebody who's a shortstop who um, is going to be a potential, we'll call it um, second round pick, mm-hmm. right? So has the chance to sign for some money, maybe not a ton, but he has a chance to sign for some. As an agent, knowing what I know, if I was in that player's shoes, the way that I would be looking at that is I'd say, okay, um, I understand that the more money I sign for, the more opportunity that I'm going to have in professional baseball, mm-hmm. right? If a team invests $2 million into me versus $6 million, you can understand that the $6 million figure is going to obviously entice them and force them to have you get to the big leagues, whether it's sooner or potentially just more you know, chances. That's right. Exactly. So um, if I'm that player, that's that's one of the things I'm focusing on. And then I'm balancing that with, do I want to go to school? And so the conversations that I will have with players is they will flat out tell me like, Matt, I'm not going to school you know, I want as much money as I possibly can. Just I'm not a student, man. And so that player, it's it's a little bit more easy to kind of go through that process. Yeah. Right. Because they just want as much money as possible. Um, now, but what for, if it's not that player? What if it's someone that's a good student that wants to get educated, that wants to think about life business, uh, you know, after baseball, but they are going to be a first round draft pick where I don't know what is a first round draft pick. I mean, you could say a pitcher if you're a stud pitcher and you're going to be the first 10 guys drafted. He, couple, you know. I, I love having this conversation. It's such a a it's a it's a really loaded question. And so let's like dive into that a little bit. Yeah, right? I'm sure. Right? Yeah, <laughs> there's so, many. so there's a kid I, I uh, advised a couple years ago out of he was initially out of Colorado kid by yeah. the name of Cole Wynn with uh-huh. the Texas Rangers. OK. And so Cole Wynn was a kid who, um, this is is actually a really, really interesting story from the start. So Cole Wynn was a kid who was committed to Notre Dame, right? I end up meeting the kid. Uh, It was in, it was his sophomore year in high school. He had just gone to an event. I end up meeting him and his family and he was committed to Notre Dame, Mm -hmm. right? And so I saw him throw and I saw this kid is going to be good. I didn't know how good quite yet, but based on all the individual people that I spoke to, 
I was willing to trust their assessment, mm -hmm. right? And they were telling me this kid's gonna be a superstar. So I ended up meeting him and his family. And the nice thing for me is, just like it's for you, when you deal with a client who like, they are they are the nicest people I've ever yeah, met. it's a pleasure. Super respectful. I, I thoroughly enjoy talking to the family, the kid, like to this day, I could talk to him for two hours every yeah, day. Yeah, they right? become family. They Seriously, and they, and they certainly did. Um, and so, you know, one of the th first things he tells me is he's like, look, um, you know, I committed to Notre Dame extremely early. Um, you know, I'm not so sure. I really don't hear from the coaching staff much. And, you know, and then for me, it's like, okay, let me get to know this kid. Like what's important to him? What makes him tick? Yeah. And so all of these things that I'm gathering from him, it's obviously going to go into kind of my guidance to right. what I think is best for him. Because I can't, I don't want to be the guy that just tells you, Hey, so we're going to look at this the same way I looked at this for Albert Pujols yeah. or Manny Machado or Josh Donaldson or Joey Votto. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. So what I ultimately learned was he actually didn't want to go to Notre Dame. It was, it, you know, he ended up going to uh, Notre Dame. He took a trip and great school, right? Yeah. He had a phenomenal time, but he just felt like he was forced into like just making this decision and committing. And so reflecting back now, obviously he's got a ton of schools that are now reaching out to him. And he's like, you know what? I really... I just don't see myself going to school there. And so when he said that, I realized, okay, you have to decommit because I don't want you to be in a position where you're going through the draft process, knowing that you're not gonna go to school because we don't know how the draft is gonna go. Yeah. You can think, hey, I'm gonna be a first rounder. You know, it's 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 already, you know, I've already done all the work. It's, it's proven I'm gonna be, yeah. you can think that way. And then all of a sudden, knock on wood, there's an injury, right? Knock on wood. Uh, you don't throw well in front of the right people and now you slip, slip. in the draft. So it's not a no-brainer. That's right. Every so time I it's... tell, I told him and I told all my other kids, look, you need to put yourself in the mindset of you are going to college. Because if you can do that and you don't go to college, it's only because a team just paid you a ton of money to buy you out of that opportunity. Yeah. But if you end up going to college, you're not, you're not disappointed. You're not bummed. Right. Yeah. You, you were planning on going to college, yeah. right? And so what he ends up doing is he then goes to visit a bunch of different schools. He ends up uh, mm -hmm. deciding on Mississippi State, mm -hmm. right? And so fast forward now, he's now going into his senior season. It's the summer of his junior year. And uh, he ends up transferring out to Orange Lutheran in Southern California. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. Dad had the luxury of getting, you know, business was good out in Southern California. Um, and obviously they paid attention to, you know, how many first rounders had come out of Colorado, you know, and I reached out to a bunch of different teams and scouting directors and what I ultimately heard was, you know, it's very hard because of the weather and where the scouts are located to get in and out of Denver, um, you know, and do it enough to see him as much as I would need to see him to, to be a first round a, yeah. pick. Exactly. So uh, what ends up happening is, you know, family, again, fortunate enough to, to transfer out to Southern California to go to Orange Lutheran. The kid ends up being a, you know, 15th overall pick. Mm hmm. Um, but that analysis through that a week before the draft or two weeks before the draft, maybe there was an incident. It actually was longer than that. It was about a month before the draft. The Mississippi state coach ends up getting fired from Mississippi state. And that was the reason why he committed to Mississippi state. And so even at that time, a month before the draft, I knew he was going to go good in the draft. I didn't know where I had no idea, but I knew he's going to get what he ultimately wants. Yeah. But even then I said, listen, Cole, you have to find out. We have to go to another school then we have to, because I'm not going to have you go through the draft process knowing you're not going to college. Right. If your back's against the wall, I want you to make a decision with all the information. And I need, I would feel more comfortable if you said, look, I'm hoping that I get signed. I'm hoping that I go, you know, to pro ball, but if it doesn't happen, I know that I have a good fallback. Yeah. I needed him to have that fallback. Yeah. So that's a guy who I, I would say there was a 2% chance he was going to go to college. But still, you have to set it up to where you're finding a good backup plan. Yeah. 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 And with the guys that you're bumping into at that high level, the first round guys, is could you say, hey, it's 50-50 what they're thinking, what they want to do? Or is it... They're no. first round guys. They know they're getting big money. Most of them want to go pro or is it, the, is it just so completely different each time? I think you have to look at it and say, okay, well, where am I going to get drafted? Right. If I'm a first round pick, what are my, what are the odds that I improve my draft stock come three years from now? Right. If I'm a 22nd pick overall, okay. I can get drafted 21 picks higher. Right. What are the chances of that? that what is the risk? Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, you know, people throw out the, the injury risk by going to college. Like, hey, I don't want to get hurt in college. 
the only guys that really get hurt are going to be the arms, right? So if you're a Pitchers. position player, you know, that you're not a football player, right? It's mm -hmm. not likely that you're going to, it could happen. I don't want right. to discount it. It could but happen, it's but not it's not a likely. High probability. Yeah. If you're a pitcher, it certainly can happen. Yeah. So all my job again is just, I want to make sure that the family has all of the information and they're analyzing it the right way. And at the end of the day, whatever they decide, it's, a, it's on them. It's, on them. it's yeah. hey, I want them to be comfortable. If I feel like the family's not analyzing it the right way, then we're going to keep talking about it. Yeah. Um, but those are conversations we have literally starting in January and we're talking daily leading up to the draft. Right. In you June. Know? So yeah. And then what is your take now then the other side of this coin of, hey, some college players are going to start getting paid. Uh, do you have a stance of view where this is going to lead? What's your take on it? I don't know. I, I think we have to, you know, we have to be patient and see how it plays out. I think right. baseball is different. I think with basketball really and, and not so much in California basketball other than guys that go to maybe UCLA, but really football Football's players, the those are the guys, you know, the quarterback at USC who's yeah. going to have an opportunity to do these deals. That's the guy that's really going to see an effect from this. Right. But like a baseball kid, yeah. I just don't see. Not the shortstop at Fullerton. No there's just really. not a market for it, yeah. you know. And so I think we all have to be patient and like let it play out and let's see how, yeah. you know, how this goes. Yeah, I'll be interested to see because when I think about that part of it, yeah, I don't see big time business happening unless you're a big time football or one of the big times uh, basketball guys. But if you are that shortstop at Fullerton, maybe you get a thousand bucks from Ford and Fullerton to come and sign. I don't know. You know, maybe there's a yeah. little money that some guys can make here and there. It's not going to be life changing money or things that. Right. At least, you know, at least unless you're the stud quarterback at Notre Dame or SC or Alabama or whatever. Yeah. I just, I mean, we're so, we're so early into this really <clears throat> going down that I don't quite know yet how, like what the, what the residual effect is going to be. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, look, we'll we'll certainly see. I think to see how hard these guys work in college, I think they do deserve something. Yeah. Right. Sure. But I I don't think that it should ruin, you know, the college game. And I'm not saying that it would, but that's something that we all will pay attention to. Yeah. What is your uh, your take on like one and done? I know baseball doesn't really have that, yeah. so it's not really a baseball thing. But do you have a feeling uh, pros or con against? basketball or football where it's you know guys aren't they're going to college but it's one year and they're getting drafted i like that that football and basketball actually tell their guys to go to college i think it's why you see college basketball and football being so good yeah. you know if if college football players had the luxury of uh going to the nfl out of high school yeah i don't think college football would be what it is today and so sure. when i look at college baseball i wish college baseball um was better i wish yeah. you could see you know, these teams truly competing because it's such a special sport. And I think that like, you know, for the most part, the country kind of just like, oh yeah, baseball's on. That's, I totally forgot about that in college. Anyways. Right, right. Um, and I also think, look, I think professional baseball does wonders for the development of players, but I think there are some programs in college that can also do a really good job as well. And so uh, giving these college coaches and strength coaches an opportunity to work with some of those young up and coming superstar players, I think would be neat to see. Yeah. Um, I, I actually think that they should have wood base, uh, wood, bats wood bats in college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it should start there because it's so difficult for these scouts to evaluate a player based on, you know, them using these these metal bats. It's like you have you have no idea how they're gonna adjust. You, yeah, what's board. gonna happen? What's gonna happen when this kid's in, uh, you know, again Burlington, Iowa, in the Midwest League, and he's using a wood bat not for the first time because he's played travel baseball and he's tried it out, but for the first time where that's all he can ever use. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's 400 at bats. What are you going right. to produce? I think it would only, it would only help the game of baseball. If, if these, uh, these wood bats were in college. And honestly, like if I was a pro team, I would provide the wood to all these colleges. Like yeah. MLB should get together, recognizing that it's good for the game and come out and say, yeah, we'll donate X number of wood bats to each yeah. program. And like divide it up amongst yourselves, yeah, you know. Yeah. And you know who's really the pure hitters and right. who are who is really taking advantage of the aluminum, but not Absolutely. really the pure hitters. So what is um I'd love to hear some funny stories. I'm sure you got so many, but if there are any interesting tidbits, anecdotes, players that have big personalities, funny stories, anything you feel like yet that you're allowed to share, at least with the Also like there's only one guy that really comes to mind, and it's Brian Wilson. Yeah. Right. He seems like a character. So Brian Wilson is like my brother. So I'm comfortable enough sharing this. <laughs> yeah. But he he is somebody who 
you know, he was at Beverly Hills and then uh, shortly after I went to and started MVP, he came with me to MVP. And it was right, you know, we left in 2010, so it was right in the Giants winning the World Series, him Got closing it. out the game, yeah. you know, the spandex tuxedo, yeah. it was all the that peak, stuff. peak, peak of his the, craziness. Yeah, the uh, Sasquatch, yeah. right? I mean, it was, it, it was such an interesting time for me personally and professionally because here I was, I mean, he was the most popular player in the game at one point, and I was his agent, right? And so, yeah. and I was at the time 28 years old. So yeah. that was really, really neat. But I, as I would sit there and talk to him, I literally felt like I was just like creative director <laughs> because here, I, I, I think the biggest thing that I was able to provide to him was like, I understood his personality and I understood his humor. And so I kept telling him like, we need to do something about this. Like we need to build this up and we need to, we need to hone in on this. Yeah. And like, you know, it, it was just it was such a unique good thing. Not and so I remember when, um, when he did the spandex tuxedo, he, he, I don't know if it was a text or a phone call, but he says, Hey, I just ordered this. And he sends me the picture and I'm looking at it and I'm like, what is that? It's like a penguin suit. Do you guys remember this? Yeah, of course. yeah, it was at the ESPYs. And so I thought it was a joke. There you go. Exactly. I'm in one of those pictures. Like oh it's so funny. And he so didn't get you in the penguin suit. No, thank God. I wouldn't have done it. And I remember I walked into his hotel room. Everybody gets ready at the Four Seasons right here in Beverly Hills. And yeah. I walked into his hotel room and I literally just hit the ground and started crying. And what was funny is there was like a zipper on the back and it kept coming undone. And so he ended up taking it off and I, I think he had to like put it on backwards and then like pin it right here. And so I had to go in front of him and I'm like trying to pin it on him. And he literally, like he's somebody who doesn't like, like people close to him. <laughs> and so he like almost has a panic attack and I'm like, dude, you're in a spandex tuxedo. You're about to walk the red carpet and you're worried about me pinning this on. Like, yeah, yeah. We're you're focused on the wrong yeah. thing here, buddy. And so I just remember stepping out and seeing the look on people's faces. Like that was probably the most fun I've had in this business mm -hmm. to see a guy who, like we would all talk about doing fun stuff like that, but nobody would no ever would pull do it. Off. This guy actually did it he and then the would do it repeatedly. It. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he balls. was, he's one of the smartest players I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Where's, what's he doing now? Is he so, working in baseball? You know what's funny is he's actually, uh, he's building a home in. Oh yeah, I heard that. He's developing Yeah, homes. he's developing a home. That's right. He's, he's still doing or? this one. No, it's in it's in Hollywood. I want to say it's off like the Bird Streets. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that's um, right. I remember, I do remember hearing yeah, that. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's, still, he's still building it. It's not, I don't think it's far away from being done. I actually yeah. was with him uh, a week or so ago. Um, but yeah, he's one of my, my dearest friends and we'll be brothers forever. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Any other fun Cuban Dominican players? So I've heard some stuff through the years, but some Yas, some Puig stories. Oh God, I've heard some crazy stuff, I but I, I won't I, mention it. I'm trying to if think you, of if any. You can, if you got any other good stories. When someone gets traded. So uh, it depends on the player. I mean, obviously, you know, Manny got traded from the Orioles to the Dodgers, right? And that was right around the all-star game. If you recall yeah. last year. Maybe. And so, um, you know, it was really interesting because, you know, everybody knows Manny's a free agent at the end of the year. And so the Orioles weren't really a good team at the time. So, you know, everybody was bidding, essentially trying to get him. And so there was, you know, obviously you're, you're seeing the rumors just fly every single day. And um, the unique thing about his situation is he played on the Orioles. Well, the Yankees were one of the teams that wanted him. They're in his division, East, right? Yeah, yeah, East. Um, you know, there were countless teams that wanted him, but they ended up, if you recall, uh, waiting and waiting and waiting. A lot of people thought it was going to happen in the offseason last year, and then he ended up going to spring training with the team. So they ended up doing it right after the All-Star break. I think it was literally like the day after the All-Star break, um, and it was very close to being Milwaukee. That was a potential team. Wow. And he ended up going to the Dodgers. And I just remember, um, you know, it's not like as an agent you find out a week before it happens and then you prepare your guy and all that like a lot of times because of social media nowadays they want to let the player know first so he's not taken you know off That's guard surprise. Yeah. and uh you know but it's it's risky because you know you know uh, if if you're the baltimore orioles and the gm the assistant gm and let's just say three other people know how many writers do those people know where they're going to tip off somebody yeah. and now it's out in the media yeah. and now manny doesn't know yet and he's finding out in the media so um, they try to keep it pretty tight-lipped, which I completely respect and understand. Uh, so oftentimes it's 
They may call us and then call the player immediately. They may call the player first. It really just depends. So how much time did Manny have to pack a bag and say, oh, I got to get to L.A.? So it, I mean, I, is it like you're I, going in three hours or does no, he so know oh, we're in the we're getting deep in negotiations? So in the next couple of days, we're going to be moving to L.A. So he was told, from what I remember, the, so the All-Star game is on a Tuesday. Monday is the home run derby, which is off for everybody. And then Sunday is the last game of the first half. I believe he was told from what my recollection, if it serves me right, he was told on Sunday, look, I think it's going to be over the break, right? But it wasn't definitive by yeah. any means. So he was tipped off of that. And then the All-Star game is on Tuesday. We found out on Wednesday. So the next day, they had an off day on Thursday, and then they played the first day on Friday in Milwaukee. And so I ended up going to Milwaukee, met them. And so he basically, um, the All-Star game was where? DC, I want to say. I believe it was in DC. And so he ended up flying. Uh, DC, obviously, is close to Baltimore. Went back yep. to Baltimore, packed up his stuff, flew to Milwaukee. Uh, his wife came with him, and then from there went to LA. And so it's yeah, pretty it's like, quick. Oh, absolutely. It's pretty quick. Yep. You got to get your gear together, your it's, deal with it's, your kids, your family. Oh, and finding a place to stay. It's, it's not yeah. easy, man. It, it happens really quick. Really fast. Yeah. What do you think about nationals here? Up 2 0. In the World Series, you know, they got Bryce Harper goes to Philadelphia. Uh -huh. Leave was just mentioning, and here we are. They beat the Dodgers. So first of all, heartbroken the Dodgers. But what do you, how if if Kershaw, if we do this a hundred more times and Kershaw comes in a hundred more, how many times are, is, are they going to hit two home runs? Yeah, I mean, probably Never? not. Probably not. Kershaw and and you know, everyone wants to blame under, Doc well, and Kershaw. Well, and, this and, that. and that's a little unfair. And I'll tell you, like. He's a he's a phenomenal pitcher. He's of arguably course. one of the best pitchers in our generation, right? And so I think, you know, I don't think fans understand the difficulty of coming when you're a starter oh, coming it's awful. in in coming relief, in off relief, and... right? Especially in that situation, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We of can course. all look back on it now and say, oh, that was a mistake. Well, if he gets out of that, everybody's saying that Clayton Kershaw is his hero. So yeah. um, I think we all have to kind of look at it through that lens. Uh, but look, I mean, if I was Doc, I completely understand the decision he made. I mean, you're talking about, again, one, one of the greatest, best pitchers. Yeah. If I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose with my best pitcher on the mound. Because mm -hmm. can you imagine if he didn't do that and, and then lost. threw someone else and they lost? Yeah. Now they're saying, well, how come you didn't use Kershaw in that yeah, situation, yeah, yeah, right? right? So you're damned if you do, damned, damned if you don't. Of course, that's baseball. But right? the Nationals, are, so I have two guys on the team, Kurt Suzuki and Michael Taylor. And I remember when they beat Milwaukee the way that they did, when Juan Soto hit that yeah. base hit and scored the runs in the ninth inning. I remember... Um, I remember telling Kurt, I called him after the game and I said, listen, man, and, and he, you know, he knows it. I'm not telling him anything he didn't know, but I said, this is how you go to the World Series. This is how you win a World Series because you start to believe as a team, this is meant to be, yeah. right? And so you kind of just start walking around with this arrogance and yeah. this, you know. Swagger. Um, yeah, and like lightness. you're invincible. Yeah. And so then fast forward, beating the Dodgers the way that they did yeah, that's and huge. then beating the Cardinals the way that they did. Now it's like, that's why, you know, I was just in Houston for the first two games and I saw one of my clients who's from Houston um, and, you know, we went to the game and he was telling me, hey, let's make a bet. Hey, we're going to beat, you know, we're going to beat yeah. the Nationals. And I just kept saying, like, look, I know you got Garrett Cole throwing and I know that you have uh, Verlander throwing, but I would take these other two guys yeah. against them all day long because of Lights the belief out. that they have in in that clubhouse, yeah. you know. Um, and I have two guys on the on the Astros, too, and. You know, the Astros, you know, they're a very, very talented team. They could pull this off. I'm not For saying sure. they can't. They could. But when you talk about the belief that you have as an organization, as a team, that like this is this, this is, is yours, time. it's your time. Yeah. I mean, good luck breaking that. Yeah. That's you know? pretty fast. So tell me really quick before we wind this up, give us your some your client list, some of your big name players just so we so obviously you know the the Pujolses and the Machados and Donaldson and Vados um some young up-and-coming kids we have Fernando Tatis out of San Diego yes. Good player. uh Austin Riley with Atlanta yeah um I don't know if you remember he was a kid who came up and in like a month and a half between the minor leagues and the major leagues hit like a close to bombs. 30 homers yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um JD yeah. Davis of the New York Mets uh Ryan Stanick of the Miami Marlins you yeah. know probably their future closer Hunter Wood of uh, the Cleveland Indians, Cole Tucker of the Pirates, uh, Jordan Luplo of the Indians, uh, Brian Goodwin of the Angels right here who had a mm -hmm. phenomenal season. Solid. Liam Hendricks, 
the closer who had arguably one of the best relief seasons in history with the A's. Yeah. So we uh, got a lot of guys. Yeah, we're and doing we're doing a good. Whether they're your guys or not, who do you who would you tell us if we said, hey, who are going to be some either there are already breakout stars or on the verge of sort of younger breakout stars? I mean, we know the Mike Trouts of, sure. the, of the world, but who do you see as guys that we should look out for? So I'll tell you, um, Fernando Tatis yeah. is he's the next uh, level. You can yeah. watch him on a daily basis and you just are amazed by the plays that he pulls off. Yeah. Um, there's a kid actually that I represent with the Cardinals, a kid by the name of Dylan Carlson. Uh-huh. Um, had the best year of his career this year. Like he is, everybody compares him to the, being the next Carlos Beltran. Wow. Switch hitting center fielder, can basically do everything. Um, he's an impressive kid. Um, above and beyond that, you know, you have like, I don't represent him, but Joe Adele, mm-hmm. right, with the Angels. He's going to be a special player. He's in the Arizona Fall League doing well. A kid, Brandon Marsh with the Angels, phenomenal player. Um, I have a kid actually, uh, Sam Huff who's a catcher with the Texas Rangers, who's a monster. He was the MVP of the Futures game. Yep. Hit a homer, I think, in uh, close to the end of the game, basically, to take the lead. Um, he's going to be somebody that we'll hear plenty about. Yeah. So great. So um, we got a lot of talent. We got talent. some good ones. Just Jeremiah seen... Jackson with the Angels. I mean, like, the list goes on. A lot of Angels. Yeah. The Dodgers yeah, got they, a lot of guys. Yeah. Billy Epler, the GM of the Angels, has done a really, really good job. Matt Swanson, their scouting director, phenomenal job in drafting the right players. Yeah. It'll be exciting to see them come up and – you know, obviously they have talent in the big leagues. It'll be interesting to see where Garrett Cole goes this year. I know people are talking about potentially the Angels, but um, they have so much potential. They just need a couple pieces there, and they could be, they could be a really, really good organization. Yeah, well, that'd be fun. Yeah. What would you uh, now that you are at this pinnacle of baseball success? What's the advice you would give a young Matt? You know, someone who's just agent. becoming an agent or wants to be an agent, like, or the advice you would give to yourself starting out now that you know what you know. What would you tell that? Don't that? be anything that you're not, right? Be authentic. Yeah. Um, I think in in everything in life, right? We don't even need to just talk about the agent business, but I think you know, people use the term modeling, which I, I understand and I certainly, I think that's important to like look at somebody who's successful in your field and model what they've done to get to that place. But with that being said, do that to a healthy degree. Don't do it to the point where now you're just trying to be you know, their, their essential number two, right? Mm-hmm. You need to truly be yourself and only then will you get to know how good you can be, right? And I think, good. you know, unfortunately, I think with the way that social media has gone and the internet and, and how obsessed we all are with, with technology, I think people are, are using that to a disadvantage. And I think we all just need to take a step back and just say, you know, what's important in life, right? Relationships, nurture those relationships. Yeah, human beings. Be real. Right. Yeah. Um, I think Barack Obama actually said something I was reading today at Elijah Cummings funeral. Um, and whether you like Barack Obama or not is irrelevant, but he basically said that, uh, you know, being a respectable and I'm paraphrasing, but being a respectable human being, like that's, that's okay. Yeah. Right? You don't need to feel guilty to be a good person. Right. And it's, it's so true. I think in this day and age, we're kind of, that's lost with a lot of people and, and, you know, so I, I live well my said. life by Good that wisdom. Words of wisdom right yeah. here from Matt Hanner, yeah. man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate my you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Up, it's talking exciting. a little bit. We'll do it again yeah. soon. Say hello Definitely. to Lozo. Congrats on all this massive success. I know you're just starting. I know you got a lot ahead of you. Uh, yeah, maybe don't you'll... don't be fooled by the gray hair. Yeah, don't be fooled by the gray hair. I'm 38. It, don't forget when when it's time to like make a play on the Dodgers ownership. I, I'd yeah. like to get on, on sure. that one. I'd like Absolutely. to be an owner, just a little. Give me a seat, yeah. a few. You're share. like the Gary Vaynerchuk of real estate. Yeah, yeah, he exactly. wants to be the Jets owner. You want to be the Dodgers. I want to be the Dodgers owner. owner so I'm counting on you and Lozo yeah. to make that shit happen. We it. got 30 years, so I love it. We'll figure it out. But thanks for joining us on the deal. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and we'll uh, connect with you all soon. See ya. Life for the next one. Watch me, I'm gonna be the best. 
Hey, thank you guys for listening. I really want to thank Matt for coming and hanging with us and giving us the inside scoop on professional sports and what's going on in the baseball landscape. He's such a cool guy. I love hanging with him and uh, appreciate it. You can always find Matt at MVP Sports Group on Instagram. He's MF Hannaford, H-A-N-N-A-F-O-R-D. You can find me, DannyBrownLA.com or at DannyBrownLA on Instagram. Thanks again, Best of LA, for voting us the Best Business Podcast. We have many, many more episodes coming up, so please subscribe, leave comments. Each person that likes and subscribes, it really, really helps our ratings. It helps us out. We have John Orlando coming up, the Action Junkies, Josh Levine, Rebel Radio, Greg Shane, Luxury Home Builder, building $50 million homes in Beverly Hills. And uh, we appreciate you tuning in and we hope to deliver more uh, more better content as we go see ya